I have a message that we're live. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we are live, but only the link is different. So I think people will be able to join uh, looking at it and they can see it later. I will now start the interview. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me in this program on my YouTube channel. Uh, the channel is called Physics and the and is because I not only place physics lectures, I also place uh, other interesting things. You might, uh, might have seen my favorite cycle uh, video about my cycle and also about uh, Chennai from the sky and things like that. Now, why do I have this uh, program? I know there's a live program and what is the idea of this is, you know, physics is important. I have been talking to you about uh, uh, medical physics with my lectures, but I also felt to give some spice to the program that I, uh, lectures I give. It is good to meet people who are pioneers in the field and talk to them so that it will help the junior physicists, the younger physicists who are just getting into the field to know about how the field is, whether they are in the right career path and things like that. So in a, to do this, I decided to have an episode called Physicist Corner. Initially, I thought I would call it Author's Corner, but I found somebody doing the same name. So I'm calling it Physicist Corner. And today I have, um, Dr. Jerry Batista with me. Uh, good evening, uh, good morning, Jerry. It is evening for us and it's morning for you. Uh, before I give it to you, I come to you with my questions. I would like to introduce you. Uh, Jerry is an award-winning teacher at Western University in Ontario, Canada, and is known for his very clear presentations. I, When I worked in London, Ontario, I have attended his lectures on uh, radio biology and all, it's very good uh, lectures that you get with him. And Dr. Batista actually completed his PhD at the University of uh, Toronto in 1977. And his thesis focused on computer scatter tomography with pencil cobalt beam, you know, before X-ray tomography actually uh, came in clinical. Uh, he gained clinical physics experience at the Princess Margaret Hospital and everybody knows about this hospital under the mentorship of Dr. Jack Cunningham. Uh, Dr. Jack Cunningham is an author of a book on the physics of radiology, which we call the Bible in Radiological Physics. In 1979, Jerry relocated to Cross Cancer Institute and University of Alberta in Edmonton. Uh, his research team developed a 3D treatment planning system, introducing convolution superposition dose algorithm to the world with a graduate student, Dr. Rock Mackey. Uh, I think most of you know when you talk about tomotherapy, the name, synonymous name that goes well is Dr. Rock Mackey. In 1988, he then moved to London, Ontario and became director of physics research at the London Regional Cancer Center, also serving as chair of medical biophysics at the university, Western University, until his retirement in 2017. He has mentored 40 graduate students and notable students are Dr. Rock Mackey and Dr. David Jaffrey. I, I'm sure these names are very familiar in medical physics nowadays. And he has about 180 uh, Camper Papurut residency program in North America. By 2020, over 180 medical physics were, physicists were trained in this program. And he has published over 130 peer-reviewed research articles and co-authored major research grants in collaboration with the industries. Uh, Dr. Jerry is an award-winning physicist. He received Kikbe Award. Am I pronouncing it rightly? Or Kikbe Award from the Canadian Association of Physicists and gold medal from the Canadian Organization of Medical Physicists, that is the COM, for lifetime achievements. He is now Professor Emeritus of Medical Biophysics at Oncology of and oncology at Western. It's not only academics that uh, Dr. Jerry is interested in, he is a great guitarist. And he not just uh, it, he, in the biodata, it's his part time he plays guitar, but he is a professional guitarist and is part of the London Jazz Orchestra. And uh, he enjoys producing mu music with international members of medical physics community under the theme the stochastics. The recordings are streamed online for free, aimed at raising awareness 
for food banks and worthy causes such as the Ukrainian aid, etc. I had an opportunity to work with uh, Jerry uh, during 2001 to 2003 at London, Ontario. And I used his research lab in the fourth floor. And I used to go and do uh, gel dosimetry with Kevin Jordan. And that was in his lab. And he is not only a scientist, he relates science mostly to our actual environment. And he doesn't write his name as J. Jerry Batista, uh, Jerry J. Batista. He writes as J. Squire B. You know, the brings in math to his uh, name. And once I was, uh, I don't know, but he won't remember once he was uh, riding me in his car, giving me a lift. And in front of us, there was a car which had the number plate as TCP. He immediately said, Paul, you see tumor control probability there. You know, that is the way he relates everything to science, everything in our life to science. And he, as I said, he's a great guitarist. And uh, one of his lectures he gave to our CMPI related guitar with MRI. Uh, good morning and welcome you again, Jerry, to this program. And I thank you for accepting and being live with me in this program. You, know, you must be moving to winter from fall, and I think you are looking forward to the beautiful snow in London. <laughs> and before I start this conversation, I'm sure everybody who came into this profession will have a story about that. I keep telling my students how I became a physicist and how I became a medical physicist, an interesting long story. I'm not going to narrate it now, but I would like to know from you. What prompted you to take medical physics as a career? Is there anything interesting that you'd like to share for our youngsters? Well, I'll answer the question. Thank you for inviting me. I hope that you can hear me okay. Yes. Okay. Um, and my story of, of the beginning of medical physics uh, took place after I obtained my bachelor's degree uh, in, in physics. Um, I was then looking for a graduate program, and we have a highway in Ontario, Canada called the 401, and along that highway, there are many, many uh, universities, uh, five or six at least, and so I stopped at every university along the way, along the highway, and, and tried to meet some people in the physics departments, and when I arrived in London, um, someone had mentioned that there is a group working in medical physics uh, at the cancer center. And I thought that's interesting, you know, physics being applied to the human condition and, and illness and medicine, I should, I should visit there. So I arranged for a visit to the cancer center. And by the way, that cancer center was the, the first in the world to use cobalt 60 radiation. So it was pretty exciting uh, historically. And I met a very tall gentleman with a white lab coat, Dr. John McDonald, not, not our first prime minister, but the same name. <laughs> and um, he, he showed me the, the, the cobalt units and so on. There was a LINAC as well, one, one's a low energy LINAC, and, and a Betatron, 35 MeV Betatron, which was very impressive, very large, noisy device. And then he took me to his office and asked me a few interview questions. And while he was doing that, uh, a patient walked by his office door and the patient seemed a little bit confused. So he stopped the interview and he went to talk to the patient and reoriented the patient and told them where to go for their treatment or their, um, their follow-up visit, whatever it was. And then he came back and sat down in the office. And at that very moment, I, I decided Medical physics is for me because it's applied. It's uh, applied to medicine. It influences cancer patients and helps them. And that was the magic moment for me. There was no turning back. So I did my, my graduate master's degree at uh, the University of Western Ontario with Dr. John McDonald, very tall gentleman who was involved in the first uh, cobalt treatments. Jay, uh, you mentioned about beta tram. I am tempted to ask a couple of questions on it because you know the hospital where I worked all these years had a beta tron in the 70s. And I didn't have a chance to work with this because when I joined it, uh, it was not working, but I had the opportunity to dismantle and put a linear actuator there. And it was a 42 MeV beta tron we had. 
Did you have a chance to work with the Betatron there? Yeah, absolutely. My master's degree was on the Betatron, a 35 MeV. It was called an Esclepitron. I think it was made in Sweden or Switzerland. I can't remember. I think Switzerland. Um, and um, my job was actually to measure the spectrum of the electrons that come out of the machine because it is a 35 MeV nominal beam, but we verified it by adding uh, an external magnet and deflecting the electrons with, uh, with that. And out came the full spectrum, including low energy electrons because of scattering in the, in, um, in the head of the machine. So it was a very interesting project in fundamental physics, building a magnetic spectrometer from scratch. And I operated it and it was not automated. It had these two big control knobs and you would steer the beam just like driving a car until you got maximum dose rate and it would click 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 uh, according to dose rate so i learned a lot of physics with that machine yes betatron uh, the betatron we had was the one, the one that was in asia the, the only one in this part of the world and i think the next one was somewhere in malaysia they had one but it was 42 i mean it worked only for five six years and then we had to dismantle and go for something Thank yeah. you. I remember. I remember that. I remember the donuts inside the the yeah. machine because yeah. it, it needed a lot of servicing, and we had to replace the donuts uh, periodically. Yeah. And uh, we had a vacuum issue there. We couldn't maintain the vacuum in the donut, and that's why we had to dismantle it. And uh, you are from Princess Margaret. I know you were mentored by Dr. Jack Cunningham. I know the name that is synonymous with medical physics, and uh, that's something. Yeah, that's I'd a like to share. I'd like to share the the book here, and also Jack's signature at the bottom here. Okay. He autographed the book for me at at some point in his life. Unfortunately, he died a few years ago. He was a a great physicist and gentleman. Yes. Um, Do you want to hear more? Yeah, I would like to hear from you. And how was it working with him? And is there any interesting anecdotes that you could give us? Because for me, that is the book that I use for teaching most of the basic radiological physics, even today. Um, well, the, the influence for sure was I, I learned my radiation physics from him directly. He was teaching from that book. And I learned at that point as well, the importance of a book that gives an intuitive feeling for all the equations and uses a lot of numerical examples to explain the physics. Um, and, and that's where I, I got that bug. And then obviously um, later on when I finished my PhD, I stayed for another two years at Princess Margaret Hospital and worked on treatment planning systems at the time TP11, which he, uh, sorry about the noise here, um, which he had um, uh, developed treatment planning systems, TP11, and, um, and, and then I got interested in algorithms at that point. As far as anecdotes, I can say that we had a coffee break time at Princess Margaret Hospital, and it was a pleasure to sit with Harold Johns and Jack Cunningham at coffee, and any topic could be discussed, scientific or non-scientific. And that was a, a real pleasure. And uh, he's a gentleman um, and great scientist and very humble, I would say. Uh, you could approach him on any topic. And we had guests, international guests, and um, it uh, was always a, a fun time. He has a booming voice as well. And uh, you could always hear him in the cafeteria. OK. <laughs> I, I had only two opportunities to meet or interact with him, once at London on LRCC and then once in a meeting uh, in Toronto. And it's, uh, you know, I, when I read the book, I always like, my mentor, Dr. Cyril, always used to say, he has read the book from cover to cover more than two, three times. Like, he always admires that book. Now, there uh, is a, there's another anecdote. There is a... I think it was the fourth edition of the book, this one, yeah. um, that I had a role in because he gave me some of the early chapter drafts. And my job was to, to look for typos 
uh, proofread it, and also to check the arithmetic in some of the numerical calculations. Now, I don't remember what chapters, but that's an experience I will always remember. Yeah. I will come on to your book now. I know uh, your book is on introduction to mega voltage X-ray dose algorithm. And difficult topic for most of us. As I usually say, this topic is something that everybody wants to know, but very few people know it thoroughly. Thank you for that. And I'm certainly going to order a copy, uh, electronic copy, because I told you like twice I lost it. I didn't receive it. Two times I tried to get it. And uh, what prompted you to take this very important topic? Um, what was in your mind to choose this? Yeah, I, I realized that treatment planning systems are used every day, computerized treatment planning systems. And I consider the backbone of those systems to be the dose algorithm. If it produces incorrect doses, uh, all that can change the way the patient is treated, the way the dose distribution will be interpreted by the radiation oncologist and the sign off of the treatment. So I, I thought the heart of a planning system, oh, sorry, the heart, that's fine. The heart of the system is the algorithm. So it's important to do it right. And I looked around and realized that a lot of the algorithms change over time and, and that they will continue to change. And it would be nice to have a one-stop shopping book that has all the algorithms, contemporary algorithms, um, and it would be easier to, to teach with that book and to learn from that book as a reference book instead of reading a hundred publications with different symbology and different authors of different clarity. So the idea was to bring it all into one package um, for educational purposes and as a reference book. Uh, when you decided that you will work on, you know, write this book or edit this book on the dose algorithm, uh, what, what you thought about who would be the readers? What was your aim? Like who you wanted to target as the target audience for your book or the readers for your book? Well, I guess as the, the probably the primary target would have been um, educators in medical physics, those who teach radiation physics, those who teach treatment planning. Um, and then that, that would spill over into the, the graduate students uh, and also the residents in medical physics. So I think um, it was primarily for the educators to make their life easier, that it would all be in one book. Um, and the hope was that also graduate students who are committed to a radiation oncology career in medical physics, that they would also have it as a reference book on their shelf uh, when they in turn start teaching again, or even at the treatment planning system, if you have to check on whether an algorithm uh, can be trusted for a clinical plan, you could you could check to see if if it corrects, for example, for electronic disequilibrium or not. Um, and so, a reference book at the planning station, um, a teaching book, and um, maybe a souvenir for the graduate students. <laughs> yeah, mostly for graduate students, that it would be helpful. That would be the the primary, ultimate, yeah the the focus group, yes. Uh, can you now just give us a you know overview of your book? You know what is there in the book uh, scientifically? Uh, give an overview. Uh, okay. Yeah, so the book has, uh, if I remember right, four hundred and seventeen pages. So it's 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 quite heavy. Um, it starts with an overview, and it's a very I would say a clinical overview. Why do we need algorithms? How accurately do we need to compute the dose distribution? How does it interact with the radiobiology? Because radiobiology is terribly nonlinear. So just knowing the dose is necessary, but not sufficient. You need to know what the impact is on the radiobiology and the clinical outcome. So that's the introduction. Um, and then it switches into a typical topic, which is radiation physics. So it covers the interactions, much like you find in other books, you know, uh, photoelectric events, uh, Compton events, and so on. But what is unique is we uh, used color graphics 
in a way that has not been used before to explain those effects. So there's some very interesting plots that you may not find in other uh, regular textbooks like by Addicts or by Johnson Cunningham uh, or by Irv Podgorsak. Um, it's, it's more colorful and it's presented uh, in a more concise way because it's only one chapter. Then we move on to an overview and the history of dose algorithms, going back to some of the early methods, uh, ratio of tissue air ratios by Cunningham, for example, and then working our way up to Boltzmann methods. Um, and it, it gives an overview of what are the common themes across all of the algorithms, what you need to know to understand them all, because they're all solving the same problem. They're just approaching it from a different angle. And then we go into the algorithms. Uh, chapters four, five, six describe the convolution methods, the Monte Carlo methods, and the Boltzmann methods. So that's the heart of the book. And finally, we talk about future developments, in particular, uh, four-dimensional dose computations, where you could um, take the dose distributions of the day and add them up to give you the the dose distribution in the patient instead of on the computer screen. And um, so those are the seven chapters. Uh, it's, uh, it's heavy duty reading. There's, there's a lot of mathematics, but there's also a lot of intuitive introduction. The initial chapters you said are in the older algorithms, right? What Cunningham's algorithm and uh, things like that. Do you think those are still relevant to today's uh, world or is it you are giving it only for students' understanding of how it evolved over the years. Well, they have two roles. Number one, you can you can uh, use them with a calculator. Basically, you can easily calculate with Excel. You can model basic beams with that. So there, it is educational. However, they are a bit dangerous uh, because as we've gone to higher energy X-rays away from cobalt, uh, a lot of their assumptions break down. So in a clinical setting, one has to be very careful. They, they may still be relevant for low energy beams, cobalt, 4 MV, 6 MV, but if we get up to 18 MV and we correct for lung inhomogeneities, um, those early methods break down. So they're risky uh, clinically uh, because they have uh, hidden assumptions. And uh, this is a book which has been edited by you. Uh, the understanding, uh, you know, for uh, the viewers, I'm saying edited book is means you are one of the co-authors and you are the main person uh, who collaborate with others to bring out the book. Am I understanding correct? Uh, that's correct. I, I wrote, um, I think, three of the seven chapters. Okay. Uh, but in addition, I had other authors who provided three very detailed okay. um, explanation of the algorithms. Yes. How was it working with experts in the field, you know, um, it is, a, a, you know, they are all working physicists and you had to get uh, the book done. Uh, I, I don't know how much time you took to complete it. How was it working with them as an editor? Well, I'll, I'll, address, I'll address the time frame. Uh, I had set a very aggressive uh, schedule of one year from beginning to end. And um, we almost did it. We completed uh, the book. I think uh, we started in March 2017. We completed the book in um, June 2018, so a little bit over a year. And the, it then went to the publishers, and they published it in January 2019. So there's another six months there. But um, it was a very aggressive schedule. Uh, we were serious about meeting it. And we interacted with each other every week online uh, by Zoom, for example, or Skype or whatever. And we reviewed the schedule and what was ahead and what was behind. I tried to keep up with the editing. If, if someone had finished a section of the book, I tried to edit so that we could catch differences in style and differences in the symbols for all the math um, early on. And um, we exchanged files, especially big files, using Dropbox. You could use Google Docs or whatever, but some of the files were big because of the graphics 
and the figures. And so we used that and, and we kept to one Dropbox. We didn't want to have multiple versions of all these chapters floating around. So the official version was the one on the Dropbox. They could, files could be picked up, edited and put back like a library. And that worked very well. So a strict schedule, um, frequent interaction, and a shared filing system. That's what did it. This is just out of curiosity. When you work with three, four uh, authors, each one will have their own way of you know, writing, which will be slightly different from your style of writing. It may not be wrong, but the style will be different. Did you have to spend time in bringing it or bringing everything together in the same style of uh, giving the information or you just adapted as they gave it? Well, that's a good question. It's a delicate line because individuals are wanting to express themselves and 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 you don't want to to stop their creativity or indicate to them that their English is not quite right. So it's a very delicate balance. Um, they were all good writers. Um, and I did a lot of massaging to try to make the style uniform across the book. But it, it's, um, it's, it's a delicate balance. And I think in the end, there's a lot of intuitive parts that I added because these specialists, they wanted to dive in their algorithm directly. And I kept saying, I don't want a whole bunch of equations. This is not about equations. I want the concepts first, and then we dig into the equations. So at the front end, I helped quite a bit. But once it got into the mathematics, I let them uh, freestyle. That, that's interesting. And uh, just for people, young physicists aspiring to write a book, we would like to know what type of software you would suggest or you used and for manuscript writing and also the reference styling and things like that. Do you have any advice or suggestions? Yeah, I, I think basically for, um, for a journal article, I mean, I have been using and most authors are using something like Word, uh, Microsoft Word, and that seems to work quite well if there are not too many equations and if the equations are simple. But for a book, we considered Word. And I also got advice from other authors like Ben Mine here, who also has published many books. And, and his advice was that if you do it in Word, then you submit the Word documents and then it goes to the publisher and then they end up rewriting it in another language, usually LaTeX for a book publication. And then there's a lot of mistakes introduced and a lot of uh, another six months to a year of almost correcting mistakes. And we didn't want that. So we decided to write the book in LaTeX to begin with. Everyone, uh, we had, I had no experience in LaTeX. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very meticulous, way of writing, you know, you have to tell um, when a letter is italic or you have to write equations uh, very carefully. So there was a learning curve, maybe, you know, two or three months, uh, but we all wrote in LaTeX. And in the end, what we delivered to the publisher was basically a full book with all the references included. We used Mendeley to keep track of references. Okay. and all the referencing was done automatically and also each author could in their in their pages they could mark uh, a key word which would then go at the very end of the book in the glossary uh, and that was all done automatically so when we gave it to the publisher basically all they had to do was push the print button okay that's that's they did some proofreading but basically they just hit the print button uh, how long did it take for them to do the proofreading? It just out of my well, that. some of it was done along the way, mm -hmm. um, so the proofreading was was pretty quick, but it it was it was not a scientific proofreading. Uh, the the proofreaders were more concerned about the English and the grammar. Uh, they did not really understand. So I was upset by that because I wanted it to be audited. So I sent some of the chapters 
to experts. I sent chapters to Anders Enho for convolution. I sent chapters to um, uh, Monte Carloists, like I think it was Alex Bialayev or Dave Rogers. So they had a quick look at it. They didn't go through it in enormous detail, but I, I, I ed added another quality assurance step. Uh, on, on Boltzmann, I sent it, I think, to Todd Waring, who works for Varian uh, and who took the code and, and made it work clinically uh, for Varian. So I had two levels, the, the grammatical person and then the scientific experts who fired back with some corrections. Um, what is the didactic level of the book? Uh, like, you know, who all will have it and uh, how, how is it being used? In so I think it, um, it, it is a teaching kind of book. So it, it, it fits very nicely to graduate students in medical physics. In North America, we have a CAMPEP program, um, CAMPEP accredited programs, and they require this kind of teaching. So it fits that level. Um, I think it would be a little rich for radiation oncology residents and for radiation oncologists as well. So I don't think that's the target audience. Um, but uh, I would say senior undergraduate and, exactly. and uh, first or second year graduate level is, is the target level. Uh, this is probably my last question. Like this book is there for about a year now, if I'm right, or a little more than a year. And what is the feedback that you got? Something that you'd like to share? Is there anything interesting that you'd like to share? So, so we've had some questions that have come in on particular equations and so on. And there are some, I must say, some very minor, um, um, tiny errors in, in tip, typography, the, the you know typos. Um, I'm happy that over 400, 17 pages that those are minor you can count them on one hand so far so we've had those that kind of feedback um, we've had feedback from educators especially the ones who reference the book or use the book to teach uh, for example at the university of um, of wisconsin in madison where dr Mackey had his career uh, they are using the book there on the teaching side and and very positive feedback I, I don't have a numerical feedback in terms of the number of books sold and so on. I've lost track of that, but it, it's becoming popular, especially as a paperback, because it's so much uh, less expensive and it's also available electronically. And, and that means that educators can, can cut and paste some graphics out of the book and put that in their slides. And then it's all consistent with the teaching. So, I'd say overall, it's been a positive response. I would have liked to receive more personal emails about the book, uh, but it hasn't it hasn't caught fire in that sense yet. <laughs> um, thank you very much, uh, Jerry. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, buy the electronic version of the book. I will be corresponding with you once I get it uh, with any of my doubts. And as always, I'm sure you'll be happy to uh, share with me. I've been using your PowerPoints and all for my lectures. Uh, thank you for spending your time. And uh, I know you have a very busy schedule over the next month and several talks uh, scheduled. And my best wishes for all your efforts. And we look forward to be to get more books. I don't know whether you have plans, but uh, more books from you on these type of very difficult topics. Well, I can show you one more book, but I don't think it's relevant to this talk. Yeah, thank you. So I did uh, manage to also publish a book on uh, guitar chord diagrams. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> so you can see my name here, but this is, uh, I call it the GPS of guitar. You can, it, it tells you where to put your fingers for various uh, chords, uh, fancy chords, Excellent. jazz chords. Excellent. But I think after those two books, I'm, I'm going to relax a little bit. I'm supposed to be retired. So there's no other books planned at this stage. Um, and um, I hope that you do interview another colleague of mine from London, Jake Van Dyke, sure. who has just published a book uh, that your audience might find interesting. Uh, 
Um, I'm going to send the link of this to Jake and ask him, would you be interested? So that will be my next job. <laughs> that's good. Um, and uh, you're free to share my email address with any of your listeners here. If they want to contact me, um, I'm happy to do that. And when you receive your ebook, if you want me to sign it electronically, maybe I could do that too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, look forward to seeing you again sometime. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you for inviting me, Paul. Thank you.